Look, um, I guess by way of, of introduction, um, I'd just like to take this opportunity firstly to welcome you all to this, um, this uh, webinar, um, funded through Beef and Lamb uh, New Zealand and ultimately your levies. So good to see that you're um, taking advantage of the, um, the opportunity there. So over to you, Ali. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm down in, in Marlborough on the east coast here and it's sunny but cold this morning, so but we're pleased to get some rain like many of you, I'm sure. So, Dave, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Um, so Dave, as I'm sure most of you know, is a practicing production animal vet and he has been for about 19 years. In a previous life, he worked as a ranch hand on a large cattle stud in Montana in the USA and he said he has got the hat to prove it. And he also spent three years as a sheep stud manager at Mount Linton Station. He has a small Hereford and Angus um, cattle stud himself and visited many studs throughout New Zealand and Australia over the last 10 years. He facilitates three RMPP action network groups um, and is extremely passionate about improving beef cow herd performance at a stud and the commercial level. So I'm really, really pleased that you can join us today, Dave. Thank you, and I'm really looking forward to your presentation. So over to you. Thanks, Ellie, and thank you uh, for the opportunity. And hi there, everyone. So um, efficiency is an interesting topic. It's very trendy, uh, not just across um, cattle, but sheep and, and industries worldwide, um, not just agriculture. So when we look up the definition of, of efficiency, it's about looking at what goes in and, and what comes out and maximizing um, the return. So that could be inputs, it could be costs, and it's outputs and, and monetary value. So um, when we look at that in terms of uh, the breeding cow efficiency, we can look at it at uh, several different aspects and views of it, um, and they're all valid, um, and we'll go through them today and we'll just hone in on the biological one, which is uh, the, the animal and the environment that, that um, they're being farmed in. Um, but I'll also touch on feed efficiency. It's a really hot topic at the moment um, and there's a lot of research being done on that and it's just starting to trickle into the New Zealand environment as well. Um, we've also now got to consider the environmental efficiency uh, of the cow. Um, obviously there's some pressures on the cow to um, cope in the environment and be acceptable in the environment that she's farmed in and, and doesn't have um, an unnecessary negative impact. So for efficiency to work in any of these levels, we need to have longevity um, to make the progress. So uh, longevity gives us the ability to cull on performance. If we haven't got that, um, we haven't got, um, we're not able to make some progress. And for the breeding cow, efficiency in New Zealand, um, in terms of the number of calves weaned per cow joined or mated, um, we've, we've hit a um, stagnated for the last 30 to 40 years at 82%. So 82 calves weaned per 100 cows mated. And we haven't shifted that figure over that entire period. Um, and longevity is one of the reasons, and we'll touch on some other ones. And reproduction, if we haven't, uh, you can't have longevity if you haven't got fertility. So um, that's one thing that we really need to drill down on. It's the biggest profit driver of a brief cow operation and, and that is reproductive efficiency. So um, the more in calf means the more pressure we can apply to cull on the performance, as I mentioned, in terms of longevity. So if we want to shift things aggressively, we would um, mate a lot more heifers to uh, get them in calf and, and put some pressure on the cow herd to, to cull out the bottom performers. The calving pattern is actually essential um, to the profitability. And um, when, we, when we're pre-testing cows uh, up in Hawke's Bay, half of our clients would say that they just want to know whether she's in calf or whether she's not in calf, and half of them would want the fetus to be aged into, into cycles or earlies and lates. And 
And if you're just asking for a yes, no answer, you're really missing out on what the value of that offspring inside here is and, and the grazing and wintering options of those animals as well. So every time a cow doesn't conceive, it's costing you $63 a head. So if she didn't get in calf in the first cycle, got in calf in the second cycle, that's 21 days. And at $3 a kilo live weight, that's $63 lost in that calf at weaning. And if it's a $4 schedule, which it was last year, it's $84 a head. So um, we, conception is a really important and getting those cows and calf at the beginning of the, of the mating period and having a really tight calving pattern is essential to the profitability of the operation. It's not just about getting cows and calf. So longevity is, is a focus on genetic fertility, ease of calving, and also having, having uh, some consideration for the non-production traits such as feet, temperament, and udder, which all affect whether she's going to be around or not. And, and of course, body condition, condition at mating drives your results. So it drives weaning rates, it drives weaning weights, and it drives uh, pregnancy rates. So heifer calving date, um, again, uh, this is really important. Um, this, if you can nail this first point, then, then you've, you've almost nailed the whole job. And that's getting these heifers in calf in the first cycle. And if you get them in calf in the first cycle, and they rebreed again in the first cycle, then 90% of the time they will stay in the herd for the rest of their life and, unless they, and they'll be culled for other reasons other than fertility. So uh, not only do they uh, last longer, but they're producing heavier calves and, and heavier weights. Um, she's significantly more profitable, as I mentioned. So this heifer calving spread is critical to the lifetime performance. Really important slide. So here's a, um, uh, this has been replicated several places around the world, and it's a really good example of um, uh, a typical heifer mating um, pattern. So these animals were, uh, you can see, there's um, three groups, uh, one group of animals uh, that were mated together as heifers, and then they were scanned, fetal scanned, aged into uh, when they can see. So there's the first cycle column, second cycle, and third cycle column. So you can see there's 87 heifers got in calf in the first cycle, 66 in the second, and 58 in the third. They then looked at these animals, followed these animals through six matings, and uh, they calculated, their, followed their performance all the way through, looking at their calf weaning weights and, and their um, number of calves weaned and, and the important figure down the bottom, how much money did these cows generate in terms of revenue. So you can see that um, the heifers that conceived in the first cycle, uh, their calf, they accumulated over their six matings uh, 1,157 kilos versus those that conceived first in the third cycle at 841 kilos. Now obviously the weaning dates vary depending on the season, so they've adjusted these weights to um, a 205 day uh, weaning. And so you can see there's a, it's, um, just under, well there's a 350 kilo difference in terms of performance over those six matings of those animals. And that is, uh, that is calf weaning weight, and it's also, the number of calves um, generated. So those in heifers in the first cycle, they produce 5.4 calvings versus the third cycle, which was 4.2 calvings. So at a $4 schedule in our system, um, the, those animals are generating 5,600 versus 4,200. So a significant difference in, in revenue generated just by having them calved in that first cycle to start with. So how, how do I make progress in that heifer mating? So uh, it really starts um, now. We've, we've, weaning our, we've weaned our heifers or we're weaning our heifers, and that's where you've got to start making the plan. So if, for example, you've weaned at uh, 200 kilos your heifers now, and you're going to bull them 20th of November, um, that's 230 days, they need to be growing in the 200 kilos at weaning, and you want to get them to 320 they need to be doing 0.6 kilos a day. And that's, that's not easy, that's a bit of a challenge, but if you get a plan going now and some monitoring in place, it can happen. 
So we want to make sure we've got some experienced bulls for a good outcome as well. And that doesn't mean they have to be older bulls. It just means that they are, know what to do. They're not shy. They know how to jump the heifer and they get on with the job right from day one. Because as, as I've shown you, day one, that, that, that first cycle is really important. And we can't afford for heifers not to conceive in those first 10 days because the bull's practicing. Because 21 days later, that's $63 a head lost. So um, consider overmating. Um, in general, we can we retain 40% of our heifers that we that we wean, um, and and that's really the, a minimum number. Just that's just to cover our uh, culling costs in terms of old age, feet, and things like that. But consider overmating to also make sure that the heifer calving pattern is really tight, and so you can overmate for 100 to still get your 40. And but they'll be the first 40 in calf, and you can cull the others or sell the others in calf or dry, but automatically you're on the front foot in terms of calving pattern and offering them the best chance to stay in the herd for their lifetime. Uh, and, and it's also important to identify poor calf rearing performance. So, heifers that rear a, a, a bad calf or poor calf for whatever reason. Uh, nine times out of ten, they'll do it the following year and the year after and the year after. So it's really important that we identify poor rearing and poor dams, shall I say, and get rid of them out of the system as soon as you can. So there's a couple of ways you can do that at a commercial level. Obviously, in the studs, we're, we're tagging and weighing at birth and we're following them through to weaning and we know how old they are and we can measure their growth rates on a daily basis work out their growth rates on a daily basis. In the commercial world, that doesn't happen, and we don't know what weight they're born at, and, and it can be a tricky um, assumption to make, um, it can be a tricky assumption to make when you don't know how old the calf is. So sometimes we're getting rid of calves that might just be the lates, but they've actually grown in an acceptable growth rate. So uh, it's a little bit tricky if you haven't got um, pregnancy test data looking for aging. So instead of just yes, no, I really encourage you to get more information and use that information out of the pregnancy scanning opportunity. So um, getting back to how we identify these poor calves, you can leave them in the yards and let the rest of them drift away and let the, the mothers will come looking for their calves so they'll come back to the yards and you'll identify most of them. Um, Another way to do it is to spray bomb the heads of the calves with an um, obvious colour and when they go to have a feed um, on their mother, and hopefully they're not multi-suckling, um, nine times out of ten you'll also um, identify the mother and you'll be able to draft her based on the spray mark that's been rubbed up onto her udder. And even over mating, um, it, it means changing your policies and juggling things a little bit and probably reducing the age of your herd, um, but these ones, a once bred heifer system using the culling as, a, as the generation of that once bred heifer is actually quite a profitable um, policy, um, but you do, do need to consider the whole farm operation with it. So I just want to talk about a few traits um, in terms of cost of production um, that we need to consider. Um, so we can get the balance right in terms of what is the efficient care for your environment. So this might be a fact that you aren't aware of. So high milking females um, have a higher metabolism and therefore even their maintenance requirements are higher even when they're dry. So they have a, um, they utilise a lot more energy because they're a higher milking female. The too much can be too costly in the environment, environment such as what we're having in the Hawke's Bay, a prolonged summer drought, and the high milking females um, are the first to tip over and disappear out of the system. So um, here's a really interesting table. Um, we've got cow A and cow B. They're both the same weight. Uh, one has got a low, that cow A has got a low milking potential, so she was in the bottom 20% of the um, population and the other was in the top 20% for, for milking. And you can see how much um, cow A ate versus cow B and the difference. So it's 357 kilos is roughly 10% difference in, in maintenance of that cow. 
So you could argue that you could run, um, for every 10 cow Bs, you could run 11 of cow A. Or, or every 100 of cow B, you could run 110 cow As. Um, so that's a, a really interesting uh, point to think about when in terms of maintenance. So uh, how do you manage this in your head? So at, at restricted levels of energy intake, these the lower milking, smaller cows with lower levels of milk production are going to be more efficient than the larger high milking cows. Um, and we see we have seen this in the uh, in the North Island in particular. The Hereford Frisian was very popular back in the 80s. Uh, she could, you know, she could produce a very big calf, and she had a high milking potential. Um, but when we had the droughts, and when and, and as the cattle cows were less profitable and pushed hard into harder environments, you know, they they didn't perform as well as the um, the traditional beef cows. And the study at uh, Massey has shown in a, in a reasonably well-fed scenario that um, these high milking cows will actually outperform the low milking cows, but the feed has to be available. And in the research environment, they can't push the cows as hard as, um, as they can in a commercial environment. So when we're in a drought and things like that, you know, they... In, in a research situation, they will end up having to supplement because of the ethics of the study. But in our drought environments or you know commercial hard hill country environments, you know we just end up pushing them harder and harder. So it's one I, I really encourage you to think about the milking potential and what really suits your environment. Great, Dave. Look, so Dave, I'm just going to interrupt there for a second. We've just got a question come through from um, James uh, Gunson. Yep. Um, he's just uh, is AI of heifers a cost-effective way to ensure first calving, uh, sorry, first cycle mating, and therefore future cow efficiency? That's a really to... um, interesting question, and it's one dear to my heart. <laughs> um, if you if you have got acceptable fertility in your um, if you've got a high fertility in your cow herd, so you're getting consistently high pregnancy rates and you um, aren't growing the cow herd, so you're not needing to generate more numbers going in, then cow AI, uh, heifer AI, is a, the synchronized is a really, really good tool. And so you could AI, so you might AI 100 heifers and you would budget on getting 45 to 50 in calf and it would steadily improve as you got better at it. Um, and, and you could cover the bottom, the other 50 as um, dries, put them into your once bred system or, or fatten them or sell them. Um, the trick is if you are, um, so the, the benefit of that AI is you can be, use the best bull um, and in that situation, you could possibly use no, no bulls to back up. So that's where the real benefits are in terms of the economic return is that you're not using um, a bull to back up. You're just using the AI, and you're looking. You'd need to budget on around fifty, uh, sort of twenty, twenty to thirty dollars for the semen per straw if you really want to chase the best, and fifty dollars for the program max, and, and that probably includes um, the AI technician as well. So, over mating to get over mating to get just the AI ones retained and selling the surplus is a really good tool. If you are still looking to get the other ones, the remaining heifers in calf, and so you need to use backup bulls because they return at quite a tight period. Um, so in the 18 to 24 days after the AI, you actually need quite a similar number of bulls to just conventional mating. So you don't make too many dollar savings in terms of using these bulls. Does that explain um, that enough? Off as Dave, and um, yeah, look, I'm sure James will ask another question if that uh, that uh, response drives um, further inquiry. So, um, look, keep those questions coming, everybody. Okay. Yeah, we've got a right. thumbs up from James. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll consider growth. So growth is obviously a profit driver, but it, it needs to be kept in check and with a moderate, mature cow weight and fats. So. Um, as EBVs came in in the early 80s and as the, uh, the European breeds turned up, the dumpy Angus and the dumpy Herefords got a 
uh, got a bit of a shock and they um, found that they needed to have some growth to be competitive in the market. And so um, breeders started using EBVs as a tool and they, and they started using uh, growth as an opportunity to catch up to the breeds, uh, the European breeds. And so um, they've been growing their animals at a rate of three kilos live weight a day for the last 40, 40 years possibly even 50 years if we, if we use the data that came out of water water. Um, so only 10% of our stud breeders actually measure the mature weight of the cow. So what's happened when they've been selecting for growth is that they've also, so they've dragged up their growth, so they're producing more profitable steers, but they've also dragged with it, because they're positively correlated, they've also dragged up their mature cow weights. The mature cow weight's actually gone up at a very similar rate to Growth. So our cows are now 150 kilos heavier than uh, what they were back in the early 80s. So yes, we've made more profitable steers, but we've also increased the cost of production in terms of maintenance of the cow herd. And we know that maintenance of the cow herd is, a, is the most costly contributor to production of the beef cow system. So it takes up about 70% of your costs goes in just down the throat of maintaining the cow. Look, Dave, just, just on some other question. This, this is one, um, and, it, and it relates to cow um, uh, mature body weight. Um, half weight's a, a really important metric to, uh, to obtain when you're talking about breeding cow efficiency. So is cow breeding weight. Um, and I know from my experiences with working with clients that there's very few people um, actually weigh their cows. But if you are going to weigh your cows, how many should you weigh and when should you weigh? Yeah, that's, um, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, in terms of practicality, the best time to do it is at weaning. And um, that doesn't give you the full picture. Um, I can turn up to cow herds at weaning, uh, just after weaning to pregnancy test and the cows look um, light. And I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be a, this is going to be hard yakka. It's going to be pretty tense, and it's going to be pretty quiet. And I'm expecting a disappointing result, um, but we can have exceptional results. Um, and it came back to the feeding, the cow condition going into mating, and then they've obviously used them as a tool um, for the farm pasture quality over the summer, and, and done it. And they've matched the cow to the environment nicely. Um, I can also have some hippos at, at cow scanning uh, and have a bad result. So, um, however, when it comes to the metric, the ideal time to do it is the weight and the body condition score tied together at mating. But the logistics of it are challenging. You could possibly consider doing it when um, at calf marking. So sample weigh some of the cows. You probably need to do 50 cows. 50 cows will probably do a 200 cow herd, it'll do a 1,000 cow herd, uh, as long as the mobs are all relatively consistently managed. Um, and that would give you an indication. Cow weight doesn't also, doesn't give you the full picture as well because you can have tall framey cows and you can have short dumpy cows um, and they can still weigh similar. So you need to marry it up with the body condition score as well. Um, did that answer the full question? Yep, that's great. Thanks, Dave. Okay. So, um, so, so my key message is selecting on growth. Well, if you well, if you're selecting for extreme growth, and I'm mainly focusing on the 600-day growth as the as the risk factor, um, early growth is is fine. Is that you often if you if you just focusing on that, you'll change the body composition of the animal. So they will get leaner, they will get taller. They will get later maturing, uh, usually less fertile, and their fat covers will tend to go down. So you, a single trait selection with any trait, but particularly this trait, is one you want to avoid. So it's good for steer production. Um, the steer guys love them, but it's not so good for the females because they're less easy keeping. So fats, ribbon rump fat is the cow's, the cow's hay barn. Um, more positive means hold, they hold their condition better and usually they're early maturing and they've done some pretty robust studies in South Australia where 
They've been able to correlate small increases in ribbon rump fat have improved the conception pattern, calving pattern of heifers and their ability to rebreed uh, early as well. So positive ribbon rump fats are positively correlated to heifer conception. Um, so it definitely needs to be in the equation, particularly if you're focusing on, if, you, if you're a yearling heifer mating policy, that's, that's really important, less so if you're mating two-year-olds. Um, so more negative fats, they're going to be leaner, but usually have more growth, they're more suited to environments where the, where feeding out can occur uh, with cheap supplements if needed, and it has to be cheap for a cow, otherwise they don't stack up. So um, we don't see um, negative fat cows tend to disappear out of the system, and in, in, in most cow herds, if they're being pushed for priority to the lambs. So if they're really pushed hard to, to graze, uh, graze down low, they provide quality regrowth for land grazing and finishing. So um, this is um, a large number of num uh, numbers in the table, and this is an Angus breeding value table. And I just want to show you some interesting things in here. Um, and we'll start with down the left hand side to so the percentile band. So when it says top value in the first column down, that means these are the highest figures um, that occur in an animal. So um, however, when you move across to mature cow weight and it says plus 187, that is actually, it means that she is the biggest cow you can find. That doesn't mean she's the most de desirable cow. Same again with milk, plus 34, that she's an extremely high milker. Scrotal size plus 6.8, they are big kahunas. Um, so then it says top value, but that doesn't mean that's the ones you need. Um, and so I just want to draw you across to the days to calving. So days to calving is the only genetic EBV that we have for fertility. And, it, and so it's the, how, how quickly they rebreed after they've had a calf. So the top value says minus 12.4, and the bottom value says uh, low values is 8.8. .8. So they're, they're, the units are days. So there are 20 days difference between animals and their ability, these are size and their ability to rebreed from one calving to the next. Um, so you can see that there is massive opportunities to select for improved fertility um, by having a shorter rebreeding interval between calves by selecting in the top, into the top range. So if we go down to top 50%, top 50% is actually the average for the Angus breed. Um, you'll, you will note that you can't compare these tables across to other breeds. So Angus, this only works for Angus cattle. The Herefords have their own table and so do all the other breeds. So you can see even from the breed average of minus 4.1 for days to calving, um, there's still opportunity to make progress in that, in that trait. And so, um, one of the things that I've done with uh, clients that are frustrated with historic low performance and well-conditioned animals, they're ticking all the other boxes, is that we've I've gone and gone back and grabbed all the tag numbers of their herd size, and we've gone and looked up their data on breed plan, and we've looked at their days to calving, and um, nine times out of ten, I've found that um, they've actually been they go to the sales and they haven't had any consideration for the days to calving and they've focused on the animals that they like to look at. And when we've looked at their um, days to calving figures for the bull team, they're actually usually in the bottom 20 to 30%. So um, it means that we've, we've highlighted a potential problem and it means that there's great opportunity to make progress if they, if they go to the sale and having already circled the bulls in the catalogue that the data suits them. Not going Dave, to the end, uh, not going to the sorry. Sorry to interrupt, Dave. We've got a really good question here um, relating to this um, table um, from John again. The 2020 Angus average EBV for mature cow weight is plus 95. What cow weight would you suspect this to be? Does that make sense? Question mark. <laughs> um, yeah, so this would be the year, this table is the year before, but it'll be the year, the bulls that are coming up for sale. Um, we relative to this table. So um, 95 is the top 50%. So you can see here it's plus 89. So this year we've we've increased our cow weights as a breed for, by six kilos. 
So, um, cow weight, it's hard to, it's hard to um, really say how much, it varies with the herd and the condition that they're carrying, but you're, you're looking at 600 plus kilo cows now getting to close to 50% breed average. So these ones up, um, you know, I know some people have got cows at 950 kilos, their Angus, when they're fully fed, um, which is which is too big. Um, so, but um, in terms of, um, it still depends on, in terms of the actual cow weight in the commercial situation, it depends on how well the animals are growing out still at the end of the day. Um, you can still downsize your cows and have them in good condition. Um, but it's a lot more difficult if you're, if you're not putting any pressure downwards on the mature cow weight. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you, that's great. Okay. So, just, um, before you move on, just before you move on, and because we're talking about EBVs, so we've got this issue where we're, we're chasing growth rates uh, to, to, to optimise our weaning weights, and that's pushing our cow body weights up. So that's a direct correlation there. How do we go about, or what are we looking for, if we want to um, maintain a relatively small mature cow, um, but also target a better calf growth rate? What do we do? What are we looking for there? Yeah, so that's a really good question, and um, the catalogs are coming out now, and they're online now. So <laughs> we're looking for what we call sort of curve benders. So you're looking for rapid growth. Um, and then I'm tapering off to the mature cow weight. And you can um, you can see, say, at the top 50% there, 600-day um, growth of 104 and, and a mature cow weight of 89. And that's, you know, you want, to, you want the mature cow weight to be smaller and you want the 600-day to be larger than, than the other way around. Whereas you can see um, at the top, at the top there, the two figures are starting to get closer and closer together. So, and in a lot of a lot of catalogs now, you'll see some of the mature weights are even higher than the 600 day. So they are slow maturing, bigger animals that will take tend to take a lot more feeding uh, and a higher maintenance. So you definitely want the mature cow weight to be um, lower than the 600 day weight um, if you want an efficient animal. It depends on how low you want to take that um, to um to your environment that that is the question and i can't give you a one size fits all for that but um, i'm pretty happy most of the time with this with the 600 day growth in a commercial situation we don't actually reach the genetic potential so the likes of the 120s 130s we don't actually often get there and so to reach that genetic potential so the a growth around a low 100s is, is acceptable to me um because I, I don't want to increase the, the cost of production and maintenance in the, in the cow herd. So um, a couple of other columns that are of interest um, is the rib and the rump fat. So you can see we can go from the low value at the very bottom, very lean, minus five and minus six millimetres of fat right up to the top, which is six and seven. So again, um, we don't want we don't want really negative and we don't want really positive. We don't want really positive because your steers are all grade over fat, um, and we don't want really negative because your cows will be too lean and won't rebreed. So around the middle, positive fats. I tend to go. I do tend to err on the side of more positive around the one, um, around the half to the ones. Um, so they've got a bit of condition to come and go in a in an environment that's becoming more and more unpredictable. Um, it's not a it's not you don't want to get hung up on individual bulls, you want to think about it as a team. So a team of EBVs and your bull team rather than get hung up well, one might be negative and one and one's positive, that's fine. It's the team average that you want to be thinking about. That so there's a good Alex? question here, Dave. Um again from another Dave. Um is the difference between MCW and six hundred day being greater a good thing to chase? So the MCW should, should if you want a, a, an efficient animal, the MCW should be s smaller than the 600 day. So it should be, the 600 day should be big. So for example, 110 and, and mature cow weight of 
80, that would be that would be really good for a hard hill country environment. There's some there's some growth there in the kit in the offspring, uh, and then there's also um, some moderateness in the in the cow herd. So um, feed efficiency is just starting to be uh, an interesting topic. They've been doing it a long time in the, in the states, and the reason in Australia, and the reason they're doing that is um, because in the feedlots that you know they want to reduce the amount of feed that is going into their finishing animals because it's a cost. Um, so they want to reduce their feed consumption and increase their growth rates and, and finishing ability. And the topic has become more of interest in the New Zealand environment because of the greenhouse gas emissions. And we've found we're finding that more feed efficient animals obviously are eating less, so they're actually going to be producing less methane as well. And so it could be one of the tools in the box to um, use uh, to make progress in terms of reducing our emissions. There's going to be lots of other tools, but this might be one. Um, so this is a this is actually a water trough, and so you can see there's three um, shoots where the animals can step their front legs onto what is actually a way platform, and then they will drink. And you can see there's a grow safe. Uh, antenna and set, um, on the top of the water trough and that shoots off data every five seconds um, with the EID of the animal in the trough and it's in the weight of its two front legs and they've now got thousands and thousands of records so that they can predict what the weight of the two legs is and what the whole animal is going to weigh so they can um, so they um, can start measuring the weight of the animals as they go and they all, um, as you can see, this is them drinking, and so there's also they've also developed sniffers, so they can actually sniff the gases, detect the gases that are coming out of the nose of the animals. And so this data gets shot off every five seconds over to Canada, and then they send a report to the owner of the cattle um, as often as they like. So this is a similar thing at the feed bunkers. So there's four troughs there. They all those troughs have got scales on them, and so they don't weigh the animals at these troughs. They've got an EID tag in their ear. So when they go and put their head into the bunker, they know the weight of the bunker before it grazed, and they know the weight of the bunker after it grazed. So they know how much feed has been consumed, and then they go and weigh the animal at the water trough. So um, yeah, you um, you weigh you put these animals and test these animals over a 50 to 70 day period. There's a 10 day 10 to 20 day adjustment to start them, train them and then we start collecting some feed efficiency data. So um, there's uh, a grow safe system has just been set up in uh, last year in New Zealand and it's, it's got some merit as part of the package of, of what could be an improvement in terms of environmental efficiency. So an example, of, this is a very ex extreme example, um, came out of a presentation yesterday from uh, Risington when they were talking to uh, Lee Leachman, who runs a, a, a big feed efficiency measuring program in the States. So these two uh, bulls came out of the same herd and they're 10 kilos difference in yearling weight, which is their annual weight. And one on the left is eating 7.7 .7 kilos versus one on the right eating 19 kilos and they've had very similar growth rates over that period. So one's eating a hell of a lot less than the other for the same level of performance. So this is a very extreme example and you won't get that very often, but it does show that there's opportunity to make progress on this track. So um, environmental um, efficiency. So at an individual level, we want, we're looking for feed efficient animals that eat less and belch less. We want moderate size if we're looking at um, the soil damage that they can do. So we want less compaction of our cow, our cow is causing less compaction over our soils. So um, we've got healthy soils. And at a management level, you know, the, the best thing we can do from an environmental efficiency is that we can grow these animals quickly. We, we stop doing this holding these cattle up um, and stockpiling them over winters um, to, get them, to get them slaughtered quicker at a younger age. So they're on farm for shorter and so they're emitting less gas. And the number of times an animal is sold in New Zealand is quite 
it's it's quite alarming. I think the average age, average time an animal sold is I think is three or four times, and the average slaughter age is actually quite old for for cattle in New Zealand as well. It's 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 over two years. So there's opportunity there. Well, while Greg does that, the question that we uh, can have a think about is um, which cow is more efficient? Cow A at weaning has produced 240 kg calf. She is pregnant and is in condition score three. She weighs 500 kgs. And cow B at weaning has produced a 240 kg calf. She is pregnant and she is in condition score five and she weighs 570 kgs. So which cow is more efficient? So um, this, this further expands on the, um, on what I've just mentioned in that question. Um, so one, one body condition score in a beef animal is 40 kilos of live weight. So the difference between these two cows is roughly two, two body condition scores. And to put on one kilo of live weight on a cow, it takes an extra five kilos of dry matter above maintenance. I worked it out. I did. I done it all in dry matter, and I rounded the level, the numbers off, because megajoules were not as familiar. Um, so you can um, you can offer cow B. You can offer three three kilos less than maintenance to lose a kilo of live weight. So I'm, I'm not saying you do that in one day, um, but it does mean that you know you can shut her down a little bit further. So. Um, in terms of how much grass does a cow need three months out from calving, the a cow A, in condition score three, she needs to eat eight and a half kilos a day. In 580, the 580 or 570 condition score five cow, she needs to eat 9.5 kilos to maintain herself at that level. So she needs an extra kilo if you're looking to keep her going at that same condition score. So having so have, being a heavier animal through the winter means you've got to feed her more to maintain her at that level, but you could give her one kilo less a day and she would lose, offer her less um, one kilo less a day and she'd lose three hundred thirty three grams a day and end up at condition score three at calving. So that's a saving of two hundred and forty kilos of dry matter of winter feed, which you could argue is quite valuable and could be pumped into uh, another stock class. Dave, um, just, um, sorry, just before you continue on that, um, I've just got a question here from Dave Milne. Um, where can we find out the figures that cow EBVs are based on? For example, MCW plus 90 kgs based on, is it based on what figure? Question mark. Just relating back to the last slide. Um, yeah, you... If you have a look at the genetic trend graphs, um, I could probably email them out to you. Um, it will show you where we started from back in 85 and where we've got to now. Uh, and that's in the kilograms of units. But when you're, um, when you're wanting to compare the, the animal with that, the bull in front of you with um, contemporaries of that year, you need to look at the average for the year across the whole breed. And there's usually a it's usually at the bottom of those EBVs in the bull catalog or at the front of the catalog. Um, but I can email out the, what we would call the genetic trend graph to show what's happened over time for that um, mature cow weight trait. Um, so the, the last point in the slide is be careful that, um, while I'm saying you can, eat, you can offer one kilo less, that's not one kilo less than um, 9.5 right through to um, Carving, you've still got to and you've still got to allow for the increase in the in the size of the fetus inside her. So um, a cow in condition score three at the point of calving, she needs to be eating 12 kilos to be fully fed. That's maintenance and fetus. So ratios. Um, this is one of the topics that we uh, one of the metrics that uh, we like to use. Um, so for an individual. Um, the main one we look at is calf weaning weight um, to cow weaning weight at weaning. Um, and at a herd level, we look at total weight of calf weaned to total weight of cow mated. 
So in the individual level, again, I mentioned earlier in the presentation that cow weight at weaning is, is, a blunt, is blunter than it, using cow weight at joining, but it's hard to find anyone who will, who will, who will do that. So there are some limitations to these um, tools. So you can only compare similar ages of cows, of calves, same age of dams. So you, um, lactation performance uh, varies. So it varies as they get older. And obviously, uh, as they get older, they produce more milk and then they taper off. So you, um, realistically, you should only be comparing cow performance of similar age group and calf performance of similar ages. So a calf that, because the lactation isn't, you know, they don't pump out the same milk, amount of milk over their whole lactation, they peak, um, you know, in the six to, six to 10 week period after calving, um, you know, milk performance drops off and calf weights because of that can vary depending on the feed they're on thereafter. So we have to be careful of using these ratios and, and the other thing that is tricky when you're trying to compare years, and this is the frustrating thing, is that we, um, because we adjust our weaning date to the environment, if it's dry, we wean early, and, and well, we should wean early, and if it's, if it's not, we try and keep the cows going with the calf on foot. And, and, and then also, if we're targeting weaner sales, then we tend to lead the calf on, even though we might, even though we shouldn't, whereas those that are targeting different markets might wean earlier. So, ratios it can be difficult to interpret. The other thing that um, makes them a blunt tool is that they don't include body condition score. Uh, they don't include the dry matter consumed, how much she's eaten, uh, when she calved, when does she get back in calf, and the value of the calf. So, um, it's, yeah, we don't do a lot of measurement of the cow performance, and this is part of the reason why we probably have made not a lot of progress. Uh, in the uh, I'm going to jump in there if I can, Dave, because oh, this is a bit of a, a hobby for me. Um, I actually think, you know, what you talked about is absolutely spot on, I think. Uh, there are some limitations. Um, but in this instance, what I find is that um, we don't have the gross information to start off with. And um, I know you're talking about comparing specific ages and, and for, for, you know, weaning and those sorts of things which, you know, is, is fantastic. But I challenge everybody listening today um, that if you get a, a good understanding of your um, breeding efficiency, as a, as a first step, try and uh, get that um, cow weaning weight, the calf weaning weight, and look at it from a herd perspective and benchmark that. Once you've um, got that sorted um, and understand what your herd as a whole is doing, Look to, to drill down into specific age groups and the um, and if necessary, look at adjusted age at weaning and, and those sorts of things. Well, calf weights at weaning, um, but I think um, first and foremost, get started on um, that that uh, I guess herd scale uh, aspect of um, of the breeding cow efficiency. Um, so that, that's my take on it, Dave. I hope that doesn't. Um, uh, contradict uh, too much what you, you've just said there, but I think uh, if we if we um, make it easy, uh, and we're more likely to do it, and once that perks your interest, um, then you can start uh, spending a bit more time drilling down into into the, the detail a bit more. Yep, no, I um, support your um, observations um, and reasoning, Greg. Um, at a com from a commercial perspective, at a whole herd level, it's it's going to be easier to measure progress, and um, and taking some measurements to start with is the first step. Um, and then from a in commercial reality, the way of identifying poor performance is just going to be identifying the, the potty calves and identifying their dams uh, at the yards and and removing them out of the system. Um, so, um, yeah, as I mentioned, it's easy for the stud breeder and you'd hope they will be doing it, um, but difficult in the commercial world. So the RMPP have got a KPI that they have developed and you can go and benchmark yourself on the Beaver Land website and the, is it the Knowledge Hub, I think? And as it's mentioned, it's total calf wean to total herd live weight. It is, they've got it at mating and so I'm a little disappointed at that because it's just not, 
less likely to happen, but um, a weight is important to benchmark yourself regardless. And so they have um, suggested that um, the average performance out there for the cow herds that they've surveyed is 100 cows produce 82 calves weaning, weighing 200 kilos average. Can I, sorry, sorry, I'm just going to jump in there again to clarify. Uh, when we're talking about this figure, we're talking about calves born to cows mated. So when, you, when you're calculating your true calving percentage, you need to go back 18 months or more from the time of which you're weaning, correlate those calves with the, uh, the mating period. So um, it's not the spring six months prior to, um, or the mating period six months prior to, to weaning, it's the one months prior. So just to clarify that. Yep, it's, it's what went to the bull. And so um, the average cow in, them, in their surveys have weighed 550 and the efficiency of, of herd at a herd level was 30%. So um, we, we, we can see, I've seen herds that will do uh, over 40% and some, the odd one will do 45%. These tend to be quite moderate cows, um, closer to the 450 to 480, 480 kilos, um, doing a, a 200 to 250 kilo calf. So there are some herds out there doing it and the efficiency is getting towards 50%, but uh, it's small steps. So um, the other KPI targets, we've talked about pregnancy rates and, and I've tried to emphasize that it's more than just a yes, no, it's when. Um, the profit is also in when, did they, when are they going to carve in that first cycle was just so critical. And so we'd like, um, so in terms of how long should you make um, your cows and how, you, how long you should make your heifers, uh, I'm usually a fan of two, 45 days in the, in the heifers. Um, and, and if you're nervous about that, then definitely do three cycles or, or um, 63 days. But really ask to identify the last cycle. Get your scanner to pull out the last cycle of those in that mating period. So you really know or have the confidence to go shorter next time because you'll find that in, um, most heifers should be in calf in the first two cycles if they've if they reached their live weight targets. Um, and that gives you an opportunity if things get tough or, or you've got a surplus that you can get rid of the lates because there's no point in getting rid of the earlies. You know, and if you've got that information, you've got that opportunity. Cows, um, again, I'd love it if people do make their cows at for 45 days and we've got probably 40% an hour of our clients up here that do that. Um, and the rest do it for um, three cycles or 63. So, um, yeah, ideally, I mean, you're not, you're not, it's, it's a tool also for your feed management and grazing management, but also in that calf live weight and making a saleable line of, of stock at weaning. Um, so what is acceptable pregnancy rates? So we did a poll and um, earlier, some of you may or may not have been on that. And if we can get 95% plus for the cows, um, to three cycles, that would be amazing, and 93% for two cycles. Um, I'd be stoked if, if, if we could achieve that with the pregnancy rates. That's, that's a good target. Some of you might be there already. Um, and in heifers, for uh, yearling heifers this year, in our area, we've had a bit of a shocker. I'm not 100% sure why. Um, I would, uh, our average carving, uh, average pregnancy rate on our heifers for two cycles was is 82 percent. So um, the drought has possibly been pinching us longer than people recognise. Um, and where can we get to? We can get to uh, 90 percent quite comfortably. But again, it's all about planning from weaning and, and hitting those targets. Um, and how many should get in calf in the first cycle? So Heifers and cows, you should be targeting 70% conception in that first cycle. That's, that's the target. Uh, in terms of calf growth rates, um, a kilo a day um, for a straight beef cow, traditional beef cow is a, is a good target. Um, so if, if it's a 240 day from birth to weaning, uh, that's a 240 kilo calf, assuming the calf is 40 kilos born. 
Um, so that's that's a, a good target for a high performing herd that um, as long as they've got acceptable pregnancy rates. So um, yes, we need to consider a whole lot of KPIs or targets across different metrics to fully understand beef cow performance. Um, Dave, just before you um, move to your summary, um, yep. I have got a really interesting question here from Cara. Um, they are in North Canterbury, and um, we're interested in your thoughts. Um, they are hard hill country, and um, cows are Angus Hereford Cross. So about four years ago, they started growing out the heifers um, for replacements on fodder beet and mating at R2 years as opposed to R3. This year, they predominantly, um, the ones who were dry, they found were the cows that had been raised on fodder beet over the last four years. And clearly, they're in a pretty serious drought. Um, in fact, the worst on record. But she's wondering why the old cows that were grown out slowly and never bred until they were R3, are still able to get in calf, despite their body score being the same as the ones that were grow out on fodder beet. Just wondering um, your thoughts and if anyone else had come across this. Um, I haven't come across it. Um, growing growing out um, young stock um, does require um, a reasonable level of protein in the diet, and fodder beet doesn't doesn't do that. It's, fodder beet is um, quite a good fattening tool for putting condition on. Uh, but in terms of growing animals, in terms of muscle and skeletal frame, it needs to have a protein source in there. So that could be green grass or green baleage. Um, I'm not aware of the long-term impacts of that. Um, so whether that's an impact or not, I'm not sure. Um, some, if the fodder beet variety was, in, was not soft enough, then there might be some teeth issues possibly. And maybe they've had premature teeth wear. Um, um yeah they're the two things that come to mind off the top of my head yeah no thanks dave i just wonder if anyone else um had found this same sort of similar scenario whether they'd like just to make a comment in the in the chat box and um, we've also got another comment here from trish um to be able to age calf at scanning we need to scan early enough not possible if scanning at weaning when the bull was removed four months ago. <laughs> Thanks, Trish. Yep, yep, that's a good point. Um, um, we really want the minimum age of the calf to be the youngest calf when we a fetus to be 45 days. And if we're mating, so that means that the, for two cycles, um, that would be 90 days would be the oldest, and three cycles, it would be 110 days down to. 45 days. So that would be the ideal window to get the greatest accuracy in terms of fetal aging. It's, it's, it's not perfect. I mean, we've still got gestation length as another contributing factor, and in particular in the Angus, you know, they can IAO my Angus um, heifers every year, and they consistently start calving 12 days before they should. Um, and the Herefords are a little bit later than that. Um, so you will get some variation around because of the gestation length as well. So usually it would be 10, I, I normally say to my clients, 10 or plus or minus 10 days from the age that I gave them. So that I don't, that if they put their heifers in the late mob and they actually calve 10 days earlier than the lates, that they haven't not checked that mob because there was, they didn't think they were gonna calve, if that makes sense. Um, so uh, my key message is that High fertility is, is the genetics, and that's bulls. Selecting the right bulls provide 80% of the genetics, plus good management. And they need to, they go hand in hand. And obviously, if your management lets them down, no matter how good your genetics are, they won't reach the level of performance that they can. And vice versa, if you feed them really well, um, if you haven't got fertile genetics, then they can be disappointing. The, pre the results can be disappointing. So low fertility means there's no opportunity to cull on performance. You're just basically going through the motions of taking out the drives and replacing them. So the efficiency, um, um, my conclusion with the efficiency is that I haven't got the one size fits all 
um, answer for you. Um, so um, it's a little bit disappointing. Sorry if that's the case. Um, but the efficiency varies with the environment. So if you're in hard hill country, you've got to be careful of too much growth. You've got to be careful of too much milk. So in, in terms of if, if you're, uh, um, if you, again, with the condition of the, the wintering condition of the cow, so if, if, if your cows are lighter at weaning, then you can't afford to push them through the winter, but you're obviously feeding them, you can, as long as you maintain your weight, you're actually got lower costs than if you've got a cow that's in better condition. So the key message there would be if your cow's in, in condition score five or six or even seven, then if you're just trying to maintain that seven through to calving, then that's expensive because she's heavier and that's more maintenance. So if you've got fat cows and you, you need to actually work them in the winter to get that condition off to reduce their maintenance requirements, and that's the real benefit of a cow. Um, that's and 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 that saves you a lot of winter feed, and and you want to then utilise that spring feed, which is a lot cheaper to then put the condition back on. So, if you've got the condition on, you need to take it off to to make the cows competitive in terms of cost. And if you've got a cow in light condition, then you need to maintain her because taking her further will will, will down the body condition score spectrum will compromise her performance. And, and then focus on that spring grass, which is cheap and plentiful to get that condition back on so that they reach their condition score of five, five at mating. Um, so as I, yeah, as I mentioned, um, milk growth and mature weight are big considerations for controlling the cost of production. And track, use that, track the cow herd efficiency metric over time. So the total, total calf weight weaned divided by the total cow weight joined. So that does include the dry cows. 